you had a nice time together over Thanksgiving holiday. And, uh, Let's take our Bibles and open them to Titus chapter 1 to begin with. Excuse me, Titus chapter 3. As we all know, this past Thursday was a holiday, a national holiday, set aside for the purpose of expressing thanks. It's obviously never a bad thing uh, to be thankful. But the tendency in all of us is to take that, sh which we, that which we should be thankful for and not be. In fact, as time marches on through our culture and every, actually every culture throughout the world, unthankfulness has become more the rule than the exception. Paul told Timothy in his final letter, he says, know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, the lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and actually the list goes on and on. And then a few verses later in this chapter, he said, things will increase from bad to worse until the Lord returns. And I'm sure if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you know that you are to be thankful. But I thought I'd take a minute to remind us of its importance, not just for the sake of politeness or correctness, but its importance as far as God is concerned. We want to have a glimpse and a perspective or an understanding of God's perspective on thankfulness. There's never a reason not to be thankful. And yet, it's a problem. In fact, unthankfulness in the Bible is always associated with a lack of spiritual sensitivity or a lack of spiritual maturity, and it always leads to further spiritual decline. The more unthankful you are, the more worse shape you are in spiritually, the more miserable you are as a person. They're all intimately connected. Unthankfulness will destroy you spiritually, and it's worse than you think. And because we're relatively weak creatures, we need reminders. Christ was so aware of our proneness to be unthankful, I guess, that he commanded that an ordinance be, cup, be kept, the elements of bread and wine to be, remind every one of us as God's children that those who have placed their faith in Christ uh, are gonna live for all eternity in a place that's free from sin and death and ruin and suffering, it's a place of eternal joy and bliss. It will go on perpetually, and yet apart from that, we, he said, I, I need to institute the Lord's Supper to remind you to take time to remember this and remember the sacrifice he made because he knows that we're just not that good at it. You know, true God-honoring and heartfelt thankfulness begins with the Savior, and it begins with salvation. It's recognizing we've received something that we absolutely do not deserve or never could be worthy of. And, and Paul told Titus that you need to remind people of this as well. Notice chapter 3, verse 1. Remind then to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable and gentle and showing all humility to all men. Why? For we ourselves were once were foolish. This is a description of every human being prior to salvation. You were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. You were living in malice and envy. You were hateful and hating one another. Really? Yes. Verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. There's nothing we can do that God uh, puts his stamp of approval on as an unbeliever. The best is is, is a filthy rag. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, it says we were. We were is in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means this is something we were continually. We were foolish. Foolish literally means not having a mind. 
It pictures the unsaved as without spiritual understanding. They were ignorant of God. They were continually manifesting an unwillingness to use their mental faculties to understand the truth about God. That, generally speaking, depicts the mind of every believer. You know, biblical foolishness is not an issue of intelligence. It's spiritual blindness. Many unbelievers are very, very intelligent. But they lack godly wisdom and understanding. That's what makes them a fool. We're told in First or Second Corinthians chapter four and verse three and four that Satan, who's the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those that don't believe the gospels. The gospel. He's convinced them that they don't need a savior at all. That the whole thing's a joke. Or worse, in ways that their works are involved. That Christ is merely part of the equation that they can contribute something to the fact that and, and actually be worthy of everlasting life. You know, most people believe they're good enough to go to heaven or they're not bad enough to go to hell. That's painfully obvious. Anyone you talk to and you bring up that kind of a conversation, that is the normal response. They lack discernment of spiritual realities. They become darkened in their understanding. In fact, this is how Ephesians forces. This is, I say, they were testifying the Lord that you should no longer walk is the rest of the Gentiles. That's a term for an unbeliever. How do they walk? Well, they walk in the futility of their mind. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God because they're ignorant of the truth that would set them free. But why are they ignorant? Notice the blindness or hardness, is what the word means, of their heart. They're hard to the truth that sets them free, and so they draw wrong conclusions, and they think they're something when they're nothing, and they can you know, contribute to their salvation. You know, 1 Corinthians, or 2, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us the natural man, the unsaved man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, and again, they are foolishness to him. They think the whole thing's a joke. And notice, they can't know them because, again, they're spiritually discerned. The Spirit of God has to illumine our minds to the spiritual truth that will set us free. And so we were. That's emphatic in the Greek text. It's a description of every unregenerate person on the planet. And this is the state of every believer. This is what Paul was like prior to his salvation. So the foot of the cross is kind of a level footing for everyone. I, mean, Spurgeon, I read a Spurgeon quote this week. He says, well, then, if other people are foolish, we ought to bear with them. You need to recognize the unsaved are, the, are, are spiritually blind. And they need to understand what Christ did for them. But he says here in verse 2, or 3 rather, we were not only foolish, we were what? Disobedient. Literally describes one who refuses to be persuaded. So it's a, it's, a, it's a posture, picturing one who willfully disregards authority, and persuadable and compliant, contumacious. Ooh, there's a word for you. All right, they were deceived. They were literally made to wander and to go active sense or be led passive sense astray. And so... And then they were actively, however, serving what? Serving various lusts and pleasure. The word serving there is a Greek word for slave. They were in bondage to the position of a servant to act according to their master's commands. And we know from Ephesians 2 that Satan, the god of this world, has devised a world system in which he leads everyone according to the principles that he's put in place that are all centered in exalting ourselves. And so everything in some sense is working against you. In fact, living there is in the present tense. How did you live prior to salvation? You were living in malice and envy. This is what characterized your life. Malice refers to the quality of wickedness that denotes a vicious disposition, evilness, ill will, spitefulness. Well, that's not me. Well, you've had malicious thoughts about someone, if you've lived long enough, trust me. And I'm sure there's someone even maybe in this room that you envy. Why do they have that and I have this? And on we go. And it's just not wanting what another person has, but it's also resenting that person for having it. And so these are the things that describe every human being. This is a battle that even believers face because of the sin nature that exists in them. I like another Spurgeon quote, no man here has any idea of how bad he really is. He does not know how good the grace of God can be make you, nor how bad you are by nature, nor how bad you might become if that nature were left to itself. You know, apart from any moral training, you will become a savage. That's just the way it is. In fact, it's, that's how it is in many parts of even our country where there is no moral training, and children are left to themselves. And it's a sad deal. 
And so sometimes you have to appeal to someone. Are you open to the possibility of seeing you, that you're a far worse person than you realize? Obviously, you probably haven't committed mass murder. You probably wouldn't be here, but you have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and God's seed demands a bullseye 100% of the time. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet most people think they're good enough to go to heaven. Barna did a, some research here about a decade or so ago. Can a good person earn his way to heaven? Yeah, 6,242 adults nationwide. Can a good person earn his way to heaven? And those who responded yes were as follows. Assembly of God, 22%. Baptist, 38%. Presbyterian, 52 Lutheran, 54 Episcopalian, 58 Methodist, 59 and Roman Catholic, 82%. And so in the mind of those people that attended these churches that were part of this survey, drew the conclusion that, well, maybe not the Assembly of God, only some of them did, but generally speaking, hey, if you're good, you're going to make it. And this is why even as a believer, remembering the ditch you were dug from is so important. So important. Because it's directly related to thankfulness. To thankfulness. You know, salvation by work says that, yeah, I'm going to acknowledge that Christ was part of the equation, but, <clears throat> you know, I've got to do my part. And if for you it might be 10%, it might be 1%, it might be 50%. But there is, in the mind of a religious person, they are part of the equation to some extent. And so there's some contribution you have to make, and it could be any of these things. It's your own effort, though. It's what you're doing to appease a holy God. You might have to be good, go to church, give a little cash, get baptized or confirmed, pray, making promises, walking forward, asking Jesus in your heart, trying your best. The list can be endless. And yet Galatians 2.21 nullifies this. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, in other words, you attaining a state of righteousness before God came through your law keeping or your performance, then what do we need a Savior for? Christ died in vain. It was a waste of time. We wouldn't need a Savior. In fact, why is Christ called the Savior? He's called the Savior because only a Savior, Savior can save. And that's why salvation is by grace. Grace means you do nothing. Christ did it all. He provided what it takes. He paid the penalty. See, what issue, the issue that separates mankind from, from God is not their good works. It's their sins. And so what needs to be removed is their sins. And your good works don't remove sins. It's impossible. Death was required, and that's why Christ died on a cross, and there he was dying, paying the penalty you and I deserve to pay. And he died for all your sins. There's not a sin you haven't done, or will do, or have done, that Christ didn't die for, because all your sins were future 2,000 years ago when he died in your place on the cross. He cried out, it is finished. He means the bill's been paid, lock, stock, and barrel. There's nothing left to be done. He rose from the grave. And salvation is now free. It's freely offered to you, but you must accept it on God's terms by placing 100% of your trust in Christ apart from any other work on your part. Nothing. Zilch. Nada. The issue is, will I put my faith, will I depend on Christ and what he did for me on the cross? And when I'm willing to take him at his word, and when I'm willing to trust him and him alone as my Savior, the Bible is very clear that salvation is received. Eternal life is now given and yours forever as a free gift. You have a living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've got every reason in the world to be thankful. And when you remember again the ditch that you were dug from, you're going to be thankful because God was kind to you. Luke 6.35, as a believer, you're instructed to love your enemies, to good to them, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. And God will acknowledge that. He'll re your reward in heaven will be great, and you'll be a sons of the Most High. But notice, he, God, is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. You know what that means? He's kind to you and me. We're ungrateful and wicked, and God says, I have shown you kindness. And as the Spirit of God works in your heart, and you appreciate the fact that you've been shown kindness, because you're ungrateful, and you're wicked, that you can be his vessel to show that to others. Amazing, isn't it? You know, when I got saved, I remember I was very grateful. I openly expressed my thanks to God for saving me from a hell I deserve to a heaven I don't. But there was times as I grew in the Lord and failed miserably that I know you might find this hard to believe that I wasn't very grateful at all to God. There were times early in my Christian walk of faith where I didn't understand the word of God like I do today. 
I was foolish in my thinking. I was ungrateful for God's mercy in my life, for his faithfulness in my life. I thought I was entitled to more in several different realms. I was no different than Eve in the garden. And I know empirically I'm not alone. But you know, you think about Adam and Eve, they lived in perfect harmony with God. They lived in perfect harmony with creation. There was nothing wrong. They, had, they didn't have one reason to be unthankful. Zilch. God was so generous, he said, you know what, you can eat whatever you want. I got bazillions of fruit here, you can have it all, but, but there's a test. I don't want you to eat this right here. You know, life is, there's always, life is one test after another. I mean, he could have given them gruel to eat, but he didn't. He gave them a buffet. But then Satan showed up, and he doesn't mess around. He didn't try to persuade Eve that, uh, you know, he tried to, he really, you know what he always does? He assassinates the character of God. Isn't that exactly what he did? He told Eve, God's holding out on you. God knows that if you eat that, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. You're not going to die. That's a joke. He's lying to you. He persuaded her that God wasn't treating her well. Isn't that amazing? Was God treating her well? Duh. But he said, oh, no, he's not. And so she swallowed the lie. And Well, that's where we are today. Ugh. And he ensnares us with the same lie today. We want something we perceive as good, and in many cases is good. And yet our dreams don't materialize, and it's God's fault. Sometimes what we desire never shows up. And so Satan's there to whisper in your ear, what? God's really not so good after all, is he? Why, God really loved you. You wouldn't have this going on, or you wouldn't have that going on, or, or this positive thing would be happening, but since none of that's going on, how can you even think about worshiping God? He's not good. I'm good. Follow me. I'll give you what you want. Liar. God can't be anything but good. He's infinitely wise. He deeply cares for us. And he only gives his children what's good for them. Which means life might not work out like you think it should. And you might be sitting in the pew wondering, well, when is my day going to come? You know, in those moments, we are particularly vulnerable to believing the lie that God is being stingy. In some way, he's sinister. You know, I still remember I was about 27 when I quit fighting God, and I gave up all my idols. And I said, you know what? I'm, it's a big swing and a miss here, Lord. I go, I'm just going to focus on you and serving you, and I let all this stuff go. And that's when my life turned around. I remember it's distinctly Psalm 27, 13, and 14. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so what's David's divine advice here? Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I came to understand Psalm 34, 10. Those who seek the Lord will, will not lack any good thing. If I'm seeking Jesus Christ, that means everything in my life is good. The trial, the difficulty... Because he does good. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, Psalm 119, 71. And joy came back in my life, and thankfulness came out of my mouth instead of complaining, because God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good, right? But we need instruction from the Word of God. We need reminders of the Word of God, because, again, the world system around you will never encourage you to be thankful. They will encourage you to complain and demand your rights and point how, you, how you've been supposedly shortchanged in life. Right? You know, this thing about being reminded is th several places throughout the scripture. Peter, in his last message to the saints he wrote, he says, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by what? Remi ooh, by reminding you. Knowing surely I must put out this tent just as our Lord Jesus showed me. More of it, I would be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Things were important. They needed a reminder. He knew he was going to leave this planet. These are his famous last words. 
And Peter did this because he cared about these things. He wanted their lives to count for eternity. And so it actually goes on to say, even though they, they were established in these truths, he reminded them again. And you've all been taught to be thankful. But Peter was well, of our, well aware of our human weakness, our human forgetfulness. And so I'm going to try to remind us this morning to be thankful. Be thankful. And we need to be reminded because really thankfulness is something that honors the Lord. And, and spiritually, when you are floundering and wandering from God, the number one thing is you will be unthankful. Unthankful. Let's go to Psalm 100 and be reminded. Psalm 100. So you have a New King James Version this morning, which I do. There's a heading on the psalm, and it's called a psalm of thanksgiving. I think the, New, the King James says it's a psalm of praise. Verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, knowing that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. First principle here is we need to remember to praise the Lord. Verse 1, make a joyful shout to the Lord all you lands. This is a call to do that. Praise the Lord. Now when you hear that term, different things go into different people's minds depending on what they've been exposed to. Some of the over-the-top emotionalism in some religious circles can actually make believers leery of expressing their praise to the Lord. I understand that. I'm not by nature comfortable with this excess emotionalism. I've seen. I've seen that take place when there's no religious substance whatever to what's going on. It's out of balance. On the other hand, you've got some believers that will never praise the Lord. You know, a bunch of Norwegians or whatever. But what sometimes is missing is an understanding of those when there's a lot of emotionalism going on is that when there is a call to praise the Lord, there's always a cause given to praise the Lord. You know, even at the end of this psalm, it says, for the Lord is good. They're giving you a reason. There's a reason. You know, know the, the, that the Lord, he is God. There's a reason here to joyfully shout to the Lord. There's a reason to serve the Lord with gladness. You know the Lord, he is God. You know what he's done. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Why? For the Lord is good. Again, there's a cause involved. There's some understanding associated with it. There's a basis to it. It's not an appeal to your emotions or your feelings because you really might not feel like it at all. It's a base, there's an appeal to do this based on who God is and what he's provided. In fact, that's going to take place in heaven. If you go to Revelation 4, which is a scene of the church in heaven, it says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, notice what are they doing? They're giving thanks to him who sits on the throne. The 24 elders, which represent the church, fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before him, saying what? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power. Why? There's a reason for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. There's a reason. This is a legitimate reason. Next chapter, we have more of the same. Now, when he had taken the scroll, Christ and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. Again, here's the reason. 
You've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made us kings and priests to our God. And we're going to reign on earth. There's a reason. There's a call and there's a cause. It goes on to say, John says, Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands, innumerable, saying with a loud voice, this is going to be just thundering, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory be and power be to the him who sits on the throne to the Lamb forever and ever. He's worthy. He's worthy. And so if you've got this negative attitude about giving thanks to God, you don't understand God like you, you need to. Verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. And notice it doesn't say, say shout, it says what? Joyful shout. To make a joyful shout to the Lord. How do you praise him? Joyfully. Joyfully. Because this glorifies God. Psalm 50, verse 23 says, Whoever offers praise glorifies me. Have you thanked the Lord lately from the heart of hearts? Or are you meandering around, taking everything for granted? It's so easy to do. You know, the Lord delights in it. It glorifies him. It's truly a privilege to actively praise and glorify Christ. It's a verbal expression of thanksgiving. You know, do you realize that the only reason that you haven't unraveled today is because of Jesus Christ, that he's holding the whole world together and you as well. Paul said, for in him we live and move and have our being. I mean, without him, you couldn't breathe this morning. You know, by nature, though, we're fighting battles. We're self-absorbed. Our tendency in our flesh is actually to want praise from others and not give out our praise to God. And that, I trust you recognize, comes from Satan. He's devised a world system in which he wants to be praised. And every time you walk in the world system and follow his principles, you're praising Satan. He's developed a world system so which, as you yield yourself to that, you will think like he thinks, and he's getting the praise. Remember, it says in Isaiah that Satan wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to receive the praise. In fact, he's fighting for it today. When he had Christ backed him in a corner, ever had, Christ hadn't eaten in 40 days, he said, you bow down and worship me, and I'll take good care of you. That's what he wanted. That's what he wants today. And Christ said, hit the road, Jack. And Satan left. But he wants us to think the same way. He wants us to think that, you know, we really don't have to thank God or praise him or thank others. And that's why you might even have a hard time saying thanks to someone who you don't think is worthy. Like you're above them in some way. Do you praise the Lord? Do you thank him daily? Even for the little things? The longer I live, the more things I thank him for because I recognize that I'm hanging on by a thread. Things I used to take for granted, I thank him for. The closer you are to the Lord in terms of your walk, the more thankfulness is going to be coming out of your mouth. There's so many examples. After the Lord delivered the nation and killed the Egyptians who were chasing them through the Red Sea, he said the Lord is my, they sang a song, the Lord is my strength and song, he has become my salvation, he is my God, I will praise him, my Father's God, I will exalt him, until the next trial for them, right? The end of Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is the, my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. I, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise him. Psalm 42, 5. When David was depressed, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, all you servants of the Lord. Bless the, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Daily he loads you with benefits. You know, my experience has been that some believers take time to praise the Lord and others don't seem to. And a lot of times it's, it's directly related to what they're focusing on in life. Where their eyes are looking. You know, when Christ is the focus of your life, you're going to find that praise comes easy. You're going to be conscious of his providential hand in all kinds of ways. And you're going to recognize he does all things well, even when your circumstances are the exact opposite of what you want. But when you're focused on Christ, you're going to find his blessings no matter how difficult your circumstances are. I still remember... As a single guy in my mid-twenties learning this verse and being very encouraged. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name, that's a way of saying those who know who you are will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So if you have the mindset of verse 1 here, your willingness to praise God, you're going to see your circumstances in such a way that you're going to be conscious of his mercy and his grace toward you. When things are great, praise the Lord. And you know what? When they're not so great, praise the Lord. Circumstances are not the issue when it comes to praising the Lord. Job, who was in a real pickle, said, though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. In fact, when he lost everything that has value in life, he said, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job recognized he was entitled to nothing. That the Lord was master of it all, and the Lord saw fit to direct his life appropriately. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't have struggles, because he did. But if there is praise, the praise usually is there when things are good. And then when things are not so good, well, then God's often cursed, right? How could God let this happen to me? And this is why it's really a mindset. My experience, again, and I've been pastoring 20 years, is that the people tend to focus... I mean, they could, if, they st- if they took time to count, they could have a huge list of all the things that are going really good in their life. But what are they focusing on? The one negative thing, and they're bitter. It's an issue of perspective. And as bitterness takes root, it's amazing how you'll make a mountain out of every molehill in your life. And you'll think your circumstances are the problem, and they're not. And even if things were just the way you wanted, you'd still be miserable because that's really not the key. The key is thankfulness. It's a perspective. It's knowing who God is. I've mentioned this before, but what if I were to call up your co-worker, your classmate, your family member, your roommate, your neighbor, and I ask them to describe you. Will they put you in the whiner category or the grateful category? It's pretty hard to be objective with ourselves. That's why I usually have to ask someone else. You know, if you want to have an impact for Christ in a world that is incessantly complaining, express thankfulness in the face of injustice and difficulty and heartache and pain. And you're going to stick out like a light in a very dark place. Verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all your lands. Verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Truly thankful attitude is to manifest itself through serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. A healthy indication of one who's thankful is that he's serving. He's serving Christ and he's serving others. 
You know, when you see yourself that you're a product of the grace of God, and you're thankful because you're responding to the Savior that overflows in your life, that's going to be reflected in an attitude and a willingness to serve because you realize God's got you covered, and he loves you, and you're resting in your Savior. Your consciousness is faithfulness and his mercy in your life, and the natural byproduct is to want to express that to others and serve others. How are you to serve here? With drudgery, it says, right? Serve the Lord with gladness. Gladness. You know, if you've got a mindset that's thankful, what you're going to do, it's going to reflect itself in doing something with gladness. You're going to welcome the opportunity to serve others and meet a need. You're not going to look at everything like a pain in the neck. Because, again, you're conscious of the Lord's mercy in your own life. You know, it's even like we... When Jerry reads the announcement, he mentions giving. You're not, to give, you're not to give grudgingly or a necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's a principle that applies not only in giving, but in serving. It's, it's to be the same thread that runs through everything we do. Cheerfully, thankfully. Because nothing pleases you more. You know, I was thinking of it. You know, a thankful servant is a, seeks to be a faithful servant. When you're thankful, you're going to see, to see it as a privilege to serve the Lord. You know, Epaphras. Paul, Epaphras was the pastor at Colossae. Paul never been there. He says, you learned the truth from Epaphras. He's a dear fellow servant, and he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. He's serving Christ on, on the behalf of Christ or on behalf of these other believers. And not only that, what did he do? He was a bondservant of Christ. He greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I bear him witness he has a great zeal for you and those in Laodicea and those in Herapolis. He's faithful. He's in it for the Lord and for someone else's sake. Why did Paul want to stick around? He, to me, to live as Christ and to die as gain, but if I live on in the flesh, in other words, in this body, this will be me fruit for my labor. Now, what I, I'm stuck here. What I choose, I cannot tell. It's hard pressed between the two. I having desire to be with Christ, which is far better, amen. But nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So I'll stick around. Not because I want to win the Powerball, but because I can make a difference in someone else's life. See, a thankful servant truly serves Jesus Christ, recognizing no matter what you're doing, it's about Christ. What did Paul tell the Colossians? Obey in everything those who are your masters. He's talking to slaves here. What if you were a slave today and you had no freedom at all to make decisions? You were, you know, stuck in some place you'd never want to be in. He says, obey those masters, not by way of eye service, in other words, only when he's looking as a people pleaser, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as to who? The Lord. Not for men. Knowing notice from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as a reward. You're serving who? The Lord Jesus Christ. When you're thankful you count it as a privilege to serve even if the boss is a jerk of the first order. See, thankfulness and sincerity are closely related. When you're thankful, you're going to sincerely do what you want to do because it's about Christ and not about the situation. And I'm so thankful for those that are willing to serve in our body here as on to Christ. You know, frankly, there's a day coming when what's really motivating you to do what you do or you're going to give an account for. Jesus Christ is going to accurately determine what you did, why you did it, and whose strength you did it, and for what purpose was in it. Were you truly serving him or not? See, God doesn't miss anything. Eternity is in every one of our moments. Paul, or, or the, excuse me, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, 
I had to encourage these believers who were waning. He says, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. That's such a key thing. But you have shown toward his name and you've ministered to the saints and you minister. God knows this. He's got it all written down. He's got it all written down. But no one else noticed, Lord. No one else appreciated it. That don't matter. I noticed it. Because a lot of times when you're serving from the heart and no one notices or no one appreciates it, you're thinking, why am I bothering? And God says, you're bothering because I see it. And you are to serve with humility. Notice that whatever capacity you're gifted to serve in, God gave it to you. Did I go too fast? No, Romans 12, 3 here. Paul said, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, to think soberly, because God has dealt each one a measure of faith. He's given you what you stand in need of to do it, so there's really nothing to glory in. And so in humility you recognize, wow, it's my privilege to serve, and God has equipped me to serve, and so why aren't I serving? When you have a thankful heart, you're going to say, wow, I'm going to serve here. And again, you're going to serve joyfully, because that's what we read here again. Gladness, joyfully. Paul's perspective to the Philippians, if I'm being poured out as a drink offering for the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. And you should be glad and rejoice with me. This is, this is what it's all about. I couldn't be any happier to serve the Lord by serving others. That's what gave him joy. That's what thankfulness does. And he did it even though People hated him because the Corinthians, who hated him, unfortunately, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more I love you, guess what? The less I'm loved. Hmm. So why do you bother, Paul? Because it's not about him, it's about Christ. I mean, the world will tell you, if you serve someone and they disdain you, you go burn their house down. I mean, this is, and Paul says, no. I'm going to continue to love you, but the more I do it, the less I'm loved. Do you believe that serving others not only is to be done joyfully, but actually is joyful? Do you believe that? You know, some believers have a line drawn in their mind that they won't cross. They won't do it. I'm above that. I'm not going to serve that ding-dong over there. Are you kidding me? Well, really? Why did Christ bother with you? If you're such hot stuff, well, don't expect me to do that. Now, granted, I've never changed a diaper in the nursery, and I don't plan to. <laughs> but I'm very thankful for those who do. Trust me, I am. And if I had to, I would, God help me. <laughs> but... The point is, is that it's a privilege to serve and to do it joyfully. You know, Christ humbled us all. We can put a marker here. Let's go to John 13. I'm going to probably pick up some speed here, but we'll just do this here. John 13. Now, it's helpful to know, and we'll get to this in our study of the life of Christ here, but... This is where the Lord's Supper is taking place. And right before this takes place, the disciples are arguing with each other, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest among them? And Christ says, you know what? If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, become everyone's servant and become their slave. And he sends Peter and the other disciple ahead to this room to prepare the Passover meal. And it was customary, if you were hosting the meal, to come in and wash the feet of those who came in, because in that culture, your feet got filthy, you're walking in sandals and filth and all the rest of it. Here they're arguing amongst themselves who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Christ says, if you want to be the greatest, serve, and nobody washes. So Christ, who is the greatest in the universe, does what? Washes their feet. Verse 1, 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who in the world he loved him to the end. Supper being ended, the devil already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, he had come from God, he was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself, poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. Can you imagine that? This is the God of the universe that's going to die for your sins, washing feet. That's the lowest task of the lowest slave. And, and he says, I'd be happy to do it. And he says at the end, I've given you an example. But notice verse 13, or verse, uh, verse 15 says, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done. Not the feet washing, but the mindset. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The word blessed carries the idea of happy. You want to be happy in life? Find someone you despise and wash their feet. And what motivated Christ to do this was one, he knew who he was. He was secure in his God. He knew he was come from God and was going to God. And he says, having loved his own that was in the world, he loved him to the end. It was who he was in Christ and the fact that he loved motivated him to do this. And you know what? The same spirit of Christ is in you. So the same love that he demonstrated here can be demonstrated through you. And I'm sure you're thinking there's no way on God's green earth I'd ever wash that person's foot over there. You know, are you willing to be used as God would direct, even if it means humbling yourself and doing something you'd rather not do? See, a thankful servant is considerate of other people's needs and is willing to meet them. Paul was so concerned about these Philippians, he says, I have no one like-minded who will naturally care for your state. All seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character. As a son with his father, he served me with the gospel. See, when we're seeking our own, we're not going to be concerned about other people's needs. We're not. He says, I wish I could send someone else, but I can't. The only one that's passed the test who I know will do this out of love and out of sincerity and out of genuine concern for your souls is Timothy. Timothy knew what it was like to suffer for the gospel's sake. There was genuine love there. He was willing to serve. And you know what? If you're not thankful, almost invariably you're not willing to serve. You usually can't pee or see past yourself to serve someone else. And a lot of times those very same people that aren't willing to serve are critical of the ones that are serving. Either critical of how they're doing it or what they're doing or whatever it might be. You know, it's so easy for us to, generally speaking, see the insensitivity of, toward, of others toward ourselves, but rarely are we aware of the insensitivity we're demonstrating towards someone else. Because unthankfulness clouds the picture. A lot of times believers will look at unbelievers with disdain, see them as disgusting or worse, instead of seeing them as a precious soul for whom Christ died. And as I'm thankful for my own salvation, I'll have a genuine concern for someone else and their need of a savior. A thankful servant ministers for the glory of God. See, Paul, Peter told the saints this, as each one has received a gift and we all have ministered to one another, as a good steward of what? The manifold grace of God. You are what you are by the grace of God. Let's use this grace, administer. If you speak, speak as the oracles of God. If you minister, let it do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things what? God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Thankfulness will cause you to serve your Savior, which will cause outflow to the needs of someone else. 
Well, we learned something in verse 3 as we go back to Psalm 100 here. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. We're not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. See, being thankful to God is a result of a proper perspective of God. You have to know who your God is. When you know your character of God, you can then be thankful and serve him. You know, when you know God makes no mistakes, you can be thankful and serve him. You know, even Abraham was told by God that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah and Abraham was concerned because Lot lived there. His question was to God, was not the God of all the earth going to do right? And the answer is yes, he's going to do right. He makes no mistake. God has not made one mistake in your life. You've made more than you can count by a bazillion and God hasn't made one. In fact, you may have really messed up your life. God hasn't, he's doing everything to salvage that and you're still not thankful. You know, he's promised never to give you more than you can handle, right? He's promised to be faithful. He's gonna work in you and through you. Do you recognize the sovereign care in your life? Ephesians 1.11 says that we are predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. All things. So we know all things are working together for good. Joseph recognized it. He says, it's for you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So he was what? Thankful. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and in faithfulness you've afflicted me, so I can be thankful. You know, God is so sovereign that he knows when a sparrow falls and it doesn't fall with a, apart from his okay. The very hairs of your head are numbered, right? God knows you intimately. He knows exactly what your needs are. He knows how and when to meet them. If you were so important to him that he gave his all for you at the cross and paying for your sins, is he going to do anything less for you now? But he's more concerned about who you are than what you have. If you're going to be thankful and allow that thankfulness to make a difference in your life practically, you need to rest in who your God is. Praise and thanksgiving are to accompany your prayers. Verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Entering his gates figuratively speaks of entering his presence. And we're commanded to what? To be thankful to him and to bless his name. You know, after Christ, everything he's done for us, isn't it kind of funny that we still have to be commanded to be thankful? Notice the scope of thankfulness. Includes all things. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because again, how many mistakes has God made? And includes in everything. Even though in everything, everything might not be good, but since God is sovereign, he causes it to work together for good. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Consider you. What hinders you from being thankful? Well, there's a few things, but one of them is unbelief. We don't believe God is who he is. We don't believe that his promises are true and will not fail. What was new this morning, according to Lamentations 3? God's mercy. Great is his faithfulness, right? But what about this tragedy in my life, this difficulty, this person who makes my life awful? Well, God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, so I can be thankful. Let's 
go to Romans 1. I just want us to see this. Explaining the depravity of man and God's judgment on sinful men. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. They have a God conscience. God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even, even as eternal power in God and so that they are without excuse, but because though, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were what? Thankful. But became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and it's a spiral downward from there to the worst kind of moral depravity you can have. And that's what unthankfulness leads to. You're going to exchange the truth of God for a lie. You're going to worship and serve yourself rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And God will give you up to vile passions. And you will become, verse 29, filled with all unrighteousness and sexual morality and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and evil-mindedness. Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. On and on and on we could go. Thankfulness is not a moral problem, it's a spiritual problem. The more unthankful you are, the more in your mind you become wicked. You become an idolater. That characterized the nation of Israel in their unthankfulness. They became immoral and they became idolaters. See, thankfulness is not something you do. It's something that's part of you. And when you choose not to be thankful, what will characterize you and what you, you do is spiritual ruin. Spiritual ruin. You'll become bitter. You'll become proud. Instead of forgiving someone else, you'll be bitter toward them. Instead of letting things go, you'll try to punish them. You become disrespectful, uncaring, critical, unappreciative, and demanding. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Notice the mindset of David here. For a day in your course is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of witness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, bless is the man who trusts in you. See, what you value individually would dictate your thankfulness or lack thereof. And how does this psalm end? Let's go to, back to Psalm 100. Let's go to verse, look at verse 5. Here's the cause. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. God's goodness, mercy, and truth are to govern your thankfulness. It's his character. He's good. He's merciful. And he's true. Those things are enough for you to be thankful here today. Have you thanked the Lord even recently for the truth, for the word of God that has set you free? Have you thanked him for the fact that He's sovereign over your life and he's directing and undertaking, though you don't have it all figured out and you can't put all the pieces together. 
Have you thanked him for his goodness? Psalm 119, 68 says, you are good and do good. James tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Have you thanked him for the mercy he's shown you in life? I mean, if you turn over to Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that was in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies our mouth with good things. Verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us nor keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins nor punished us according to our iniquities. For his heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. This is our God. And he is worthy to be praised and to be thanked. In fact, what's Psalm 107 verse 1 say? Since I'm here... Well, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Verse 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. We are so deserving of the opposite of what you do for us. And we're so undeserving of your amazing love toward us. Help our hearts to be humble and to be grateful and not take for granted or not even be demanding or think we're entitled to something that we're not but we'd have thankful hearts knowing that we are in the hands of a loving God who does all things well help us to never lose that perspective and express our thanks to you by humbling yielding ourselves to you and allow you to work in us and through us to be used as your servants however you see fit we thank you that your grace is always sufficient Thank you for just being the amazing God that you are. In Jesus' name.